Hey guys, today we're going to make some more rings. I'm going to show you how to use a bunch of those dies I posted the other day. So what this is, this makes the base of your, um, your bezel or your stone mounting. So this is your shank. So you strike this twice, strike one of these, and then you solder it all together. So we're going to do that today. You can see this thing, this is really old, and it had a lot of rust pitting and everything. We cleaned it up with evapo rust. And even though when I strike this, you're going to see all the rust pitting that is in the piece, I can polish it off real quickly. So we can still use these dies. These are well over 100 years old. Um, I, I really love Here, show these. them the, uh, the watermark on the side from the foundry that it was Oh, yeah. So the, the way, side. yeah, the way they made these kind of dies... These are made exactly how they used to make anvils a hundred years ago. Because tool steel was really expensive, they would make just the top of this in tool steel. The body of this is basically, it's called wrought iron. It's not the same as cast iron. It's not even, it's, it's sort of a primitive steel. And uh, yeah, and it's, it's really desirable now. There used to be a, a place in France that was still rolling wrought iron, but I don't think they are anymore. I'm not sure. But uh, yeah, so you can see the difference in color. So the top is a, a high carbon steel. The body is basically real low, low carbon steel. And you can see the same thing on an anvil or even on this. Take a look at this. This is pretty cool. This is a planishing stake and it was forged from a single bar. And this was at Reed and Barton. But this top is tool steel. The top of it is a hardened tool steel plate. The body is forged wrought iron. This was made in the 1800s. It's really cool. And uh, one of my prized possessions. And the top, when I got it, it was all messed up. And we had just bought this weird machine called a lapping machine. Because this stuff is so hard, I couldn't even polish it with an angle grinder. So we got this... Uh, we had this lapping machine that's used in the optical industry, and I was trying to polish dies with it. And I couldn't even touch this with an angle grinder and stuff, and I was trying to make sure it looked beautiful and flat like it originally was. So we put it upside down on this lapping machine for like 12 hours. And it, well, it's beautiful. It polished all the pits out of it, and uh, it's magnificent. It came with this. They made this custom for it, and it, this is the original stump that it came on. And uh, I truly love this thing. It's really cool. Really cool. Anyway, let's get back to making jewelry. So the first thing we're going to do, we're going to set up the drop hammer. The process is the same if you're using one of our presses. I just, you know, i got to justify having these things, so I'm going to use my drop hammer. <laughs> it's really fun. So... We're going to set the die in there, and then you got to tighten it, otherwise you could end, launch it through your head. Now, part of this, check this out, you got to line up the, the hammer with the, with the die. So that looks pretty good. That's a good shot. So we're all good to go here. Snug it down. Next thing I'm going to do is, you know, I like to use my bandsaw to chop off pieces of silver rather than try to pour individual ingots or mill it. I usually just use my bandsaw. You guys should get one of those, those little <laughs> Milwaukee bandsaws, the porta bands. Show them the porta band. So it's just a little stand. Or a Milwaukee handheld bandsaw that connects this is it. from Swag Off-Road. It's just some guys who basically have a laser and a press brake, and they make these little bases. We hook the cord and... Yeah, step on it. It's really awesome. That's good. They're a little... No the, saw, the saws are kind of noisy, but, man, you can cut steel. You can cut anything with it. And it's got a little variable speed. It's pretty cool. And we use it a lot. More than our, I actually have a big do all bandsaw, but I like this. It's really easy to use and it's cheap. And we hook this foot pedal to it. This is the Fordham foot pedal. Otherwise, the thing just has, it stays on, which is really annoying. 
So, all right, let's get back to business. We're gonna roll this into a piece of square. Take a look. So we got a nice piece of square wire. I didn't have to pour an ingot, just poured one ingot and sawed it. Do the next one because it's going to have two shanks. I'm gonna go look at this real close and take and see, kind of judge how much metal we need for the shank and how much metal I have here. So the way these originally were done, you'd set up a kick press with a blanking tool. Let me show you a blanking tool. There's a blanking tool. So every single die like this would come with a corresponding blanking tool. And then you would, you'd take sheet. Probably, this could probably be done with 16 gauge sheet. And it would have been done in gold. These were gold rings. And you would punch out your, your blank, set it in here, strike it, and then there'd be a little bit of flashing and you put it back in the die, punch it through the die, and you have your finished shank. And then there would be a set of tools that would bend it into a round. They basically covered everything for you. But if you're only gonna make one ring like we are, by the time I set up the, the fly press, and it's easier just to do this. So we would set that on there like that. And I think I'm gonna thin this up a little bit. We're gonna go down in size a little more. And getting the full uncut experience. Yes, the full. Oh. <laughs> Just, it's yeah, okay. we make it look like we make no mistakes in the videos, but... Yeah, I, I look like I know what I'm doing in a video. <laughs> but, yeah, we're gonna... You get the full live version. So, I've thinned them down a little. Let's just go with it. I'm gonna cut them, I'm gonna shorten them up. So, we're going to take off some material here. I'm a big fan of Beverly Shears. These work great. This is a pretty big machine. This is the B3. I actually got to go on a little tour of their factory. It was in downtown Chicago. Until recently, they just sold, and they were they were still in business for like a hundred years, making it in this little tiny place with just a few employees. Really cool place. So what I'm going to do next? She's sitting right on top there, like that. Probably. Yeah, it's fine. I'm going to actually strike it. We'll have to strike it a couple times. I'm going to do it hot. You can do the same thing in your press. The exact same thing in your press. Strike it hot. Because you're not going to use any urethane. Even when you're using your hydraulic press, you're not going to use urethane. There we go. Oh yeah, I got my handy pliers. So <laughs> we'll, it's not a big rush. And the only reason I'm using this big torch is because what I that's what I have. But 
the benefit of a big torch, you can put out a lot of BTUs and get your metal hot without having to oxidize it. So you want a neutral flame or even a reducing flame. See how soft that is with the orange? This is oxidizing. That would burn your metal. This won't burn your metal. This would keep fire scale down to a minimum. We're going to heat them to a dull red. So they're a dull red. I'm going to give them, give them pretty hot. There we go. You don't have to like rush around panicking because it's cooling. It's not like we're striking steel. So we're going to set it in there like that. Okay, get on the other side. That way they can get an action shot. Yeah, <laughs> I'll come do on down close. Oh, yeah, you want to see it up close? Yeah. All right. I'm just sit down right here. Ready? Here we go. Here we go. <laughs> Shakes the building. Yeah. This is only a 50 pounder. But there's our ring. Hang on, let me let it focus here. Ah, pretty sweet, huh? Beautiful. Yep. You know, I'm going to hit it one more time. That corner needs to fill a little bit better. There we go. I bet it's cool. Yeah, it's cooled off. That looks really good. So there's our shank. Can you see it? Oh yeah. Cool. Let's do the next one. With this one I'll do the, the full... Oh, the action shot? <laughs> the full on. Everything's an action so, shot with the drop hammer. On, if it was in a factory, show them all these notches down the side of the thing. So you look at the side of this, and when we got this machine, there was all these little tick marks here. And this is where the, the striker would pull the hammer up and because they do production on this so they'd want to strike each each uh, die the exact same so <laughs> they would strike this and there was little paint ticks and they would be all different colors and basically that would show you can see they all went up to about here and then there's some up here depending on what it was but these are marks for how high to bring it so someone would just come in with a hammer and get it so you can see, I'm, I'm just kind of going, I'm just winging it more or less. <laughs> and hit it again. One more. Look. Looks pretty good. You can see the edge there. Oh, yes, a little bit. So what I'll probably do, we'll saw this out. And solder a little. And, a little no, and we'll, we'll strike it again. Oh, cool. Yeah. We'll strike it again. Where did I put my other one? Right here. Oh, cool. So the biggest challenge is making sure that they're about the same thickness. But that's where your height control would have come in. But if you're using a hydraulic press, you could strike to a certain tonnage. So you could watch your gauge. So let's, uh, so rather than me sit down on my bench and saw this out by hand, we're going to go use the bandsaw. <laughs> Is anybody watching this? Uh, 40 people. Really? Yep. Getting a lot of comments saying, how cool. I guess I'll put my safety glasses on, even though they're almost not as safe because I can't see what I'm doing. <laughs> Come on in close so you can see the excitement. So I, I cut pretty close. I don't want to... Uh... Watch your fingers. This thing will do wonders to your fingers. So 
sometimes if you know like when we've made videos i like to sit at the bench and saw so you think that that's how we do it but i i really like to use this <laughs> it's fast So now it's all roughed out. Let's do our other one. That one got caught in there. Cut the back one. You know what would be really cool is if I had my very own one of these in my shop that I didn't share with everybody, then I'd actually have a little catch thing for all the silver. <laughs> that would be pretty cool. They're, they're asking why the bandsaw doesn't need water. Oh, it runs slow. If you're using a lot of the people, like when you see those little micro mark ones and everything, they're really flying. They're going too fast. They weren't designed to cut metal. Um, to make to cut metal, you need to run the blade slowly. And when you're running the blade slow, it doesn't build up in heat. Hence, these don't get hot. I do know that they say it's designed to cut metal. It's just because they want to sell more bandsaw blades. But your blade gets torched pretty fast. But, uh, yeah, these are great. These cut steel. I mean, Vincent cut all the base plates for his rolling mill with something like this because they were stuck upstairs. <laughs> so, we'll do a... Sh you can give him a close-up of this while I prepare to strike the next guy. Right here. You should talk, Vincent. I should talk? You should talk. Okay. Like, try to entertain people. <laughs> Here's a little sneak peek of what's being worked on here at the bench. Here's the big wall of dyes. Oh, I'll show you the... Uh, the rolling mill I'm working on while dad is just yeah, centering stuff. So it's not running yet, but for those of you who've seen, I've been doing some live streams on this one. Here's the, the base plate I put it on, and then the, the motor mounts are welded up. Um, we'll have an electrician over here soon once the switch arrives, and he'll rewire the motor. And we'll plug in right there, and we'll be running. You can see it's belt driven. It's actually the original belt that came off of this machine. And it spins. And I'll be offering all this type of stuff in silver. These are all very, very specific and very special pattern rolls. They were delivered in sheep's wool in a crate. They'd been there for decades. You ready? up and we're gonna push it so you would do the exact same thing to do this because you want your piece to be nice and strong you could use urethane and make a little hollow one I'll show you a hollow one but this is gonna be the strength part of the ring so I just strike them solid and it's silver it's not like it's if you're buying silver and sheet from the big companies you're paying a lot of money if you're making it yourself it's just it's reasonable so I'm just going to set that on top there, but first thing I'm going to do is heat it, because I want to just bury it in there. Then again, you can do this with your press. You can run hot, and it will, you'll get really fast, easy impressions. Alright. Man, it's 
so quick. Yeah. Just knocks it down. Pull it out. Oh, 50 people are watching. 50 people with nothing to do on a Sunday? Yep. Isn't that shocking? Yeah, you guys, why aren't you guys in your shops making jewelry? <laughs> this is like the best time is Sunday for us because nobody's here. I have to, Vincent likes to come down here on Sundays too. I need a chisel. So, uh, there's one on my rolling mill. Oh, okay. Where? Oh, here. See, my son is very organized, unlike <laughs> me. Because his mother's very organized, sort of. <laughs> She's meticulous. Alright. So what you do, you come in here like this. Just tap, 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 tap. So when you guys get your stuff, your, your pieces stuck, you got to do the same thing as me. Multiple people say, are saying that they're, they have it playing while they're working on pieces. Oh, that's good. <laughs> Glad to hear it. All right, now get a close-up. See all the, the funny little fuzzy stuff? That's because this die was super rusty. and um, But it's okay. I'll clean it up. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over to my bandsaw, and I'm going to cut this all off and trim it. Let's go do that. Here's the other drop hammer. Uh, Jeremiah's fixing it. Well, actually, we'll, sh well, you guys probably saw that video. But uh, we're, we're, we've got two big heavy ones. So they're both getting work on. They'll be brand new when we're done. piece. I grabbed my little scraps because I just remelted all. It's sort of like found money. <laughs> you can see that this doesn't take, this really doesn't take a whole lot of time to make something to get things roughed out. Even when you're rolling your own metal and everything, I mean, we've only been at this a few minutes. A lot of it, it, it all comes down to technique. So here's, I pour a big old bar. And I open poured this. I didn't try to pour this in a vertical mold. That's really difficult. You have to get your mold nice and hot. I tend to just pour these into open face molds. I mean, this is a ridiculously big one but I have smaller ones. And we just pour them into this. I heat this up with a torch, and then as I'm melting my metal, I pour it in. And take a look. I've even got big old air bubbles in it. <laughs> I, don't, I don't care. You can see holes. So that doesn't matter. I just roll out, just roll the whole thing out and let the holes stay where they are. It doesn't matter. Cut off what you need. If you need a perfectly big sheet for something, then obviously using a vertical mold is going to get you better results but i'm tend to just do things as expediently as possible Put my, it's funny when vincent was a little kid he, he took my glasses at my my you know my magnification and for like a couple weeks i couldn't figure out where where they were i didn't know he took them and he calls them c biggers he doesn't call them, because I'd be like, Vincent, where's my magnifiers? And he's like, I don't know. And um, one day I found them, and he goes, those are my sea biggers. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty funny. So what we're going to do now 
is we're gonna rough out this this shank. We might need to strike them again, and that's okay. And I'll show you a trick that I use. Rather than, because I know a lot of you guys are getting like me where your hands hurt and everything, and filing and shoulder problems, I go after it with a fur. Should you clean your silver before you melt it and put it in a mold? Uh, what do you mean? Like, fire is the great cleanser. <laughs> fire is the great cleanser, yes. If you're, ca there's a big difference. When you're casting metal to pour it into a mold, like when you're going to cast a ring, it's very important you have clean metal. Because your silver, if you, if you melt your silver over and over again, or your gold, and you just keep reusing it, you'll have horrible looking castings. But if you are fabricating and striking and die striking, you can use garbage. And you're, I mean, I've literally melted down rope chain and snake chain, just the worst trash imaginable and made, and die struck rings from it and had no porosity, no brittleness, um, because you're literally compressing the molecules. Uh, but if you're going to cast, yeah, it's good to have clean metal. Um, a lot, that rule of putting 50% clean metal in with every pour, that comes from the casting world. But the old die striking world, um, I was talking with a friend of mine who ran a factory. And he said they'd start the morning out with like five ounces of platinum. And that five ounces of platinum would be remelted over ten times by the end of the day until there was no platinum left. They would immediately strike it, trim it, and then the stuff would go back to the melter and they would recycle, recycle, recycle until the end of the day. And then at the end of the day, they would start with more metal, but they would run the same metal all day. So I'm gonna just get in here and kind of rough this out. Now when you're doing this, your part will get hot. But that's why you let your fingers build up big heavy calluses. So you don't feel anything until it's really painful. Beth, we're roughing out the, uh, the edges of the ring shank. Mm -hmm. yep. What kind of burr is that? Just a big ball burr, kind of barrel burr. You can get, they come in all shapes and sizes. There's like a more of a cone one. The reason I grabbed this one is because it was closest. <laughs> Had something else been closer, I would have grabbed it. But that that's pretty much a story on that. So this is actually a pretty nice thickness. I don't mind this a bit. I, I like to make the rings heavy. I'm curious about the copper ring stamping. Oh, this was from a live stream yesterday. We were showing you how you can strike it solid. And we just did a little live stream. And it's, it started out as 16 gauge. And I showed you all the ways not to strike your ring. And then finally showed some proper technique and how quick it goes when you're doing it properly. <laughs> all right. So... You can see I didn't quite get that corner, but we're going to go hit this again. So that's, we're roughing it out so that when uh, we strike it again, mm -hmm. there's no silver stuck on the edges that interfere with getting a good stamping. Mm -hmm. The metal that's sticking outside absorbs the energy of the, the drop. The hammer. So the thinner it is, the further what well, you'll see. We'll actually do a measurement, a thickness measurement. I've got my calipers. Yeah. Why don't you go get your calipers and so? Okay. 
Take them on the tour where you look for them. <laughs> you get to go look at my toolbox. If my calipers are in my toolbox, I I think they are. My apron here. Yes, they are. Here's a I'll show you some old cool stuff. This is an 1860s machinist manual, bound in leather. Here's a tap holder that I made. My calipers and some hammers and other stuff I've made. You know, if you're going to have a tool, make it. Thank you for the toolbox compliments. I got it as a graduation present. People are asking what hand piece that is. Uh, this is a ferro. It's an Italian hand piece with a quick release. If your part gets stuck, just kind of jam it. And it does work with a Fordham. Yep, does work with a Fordham. Um, yeah, this one says made in oh, Italy. Yeah, made in Italy. Originato Milano. I have a few of these. I, I like these. This is what I've always used. Don't get the duplex spring. I know it's cool, that little flex spring, but the damn things break. Because I, I, I just stopped using them. I, I was all excited when I got my first duplex spring. I'm like, oh, this is the greatest thing. <laughs> but it just breaks. Let me see. I got this really awesome one I use for... Yeah, I got here. Here's the graveyard for these things. <laughs> Check this one out. Look at that. This is a Swiss one made in Switzerland, and it's um, a push pull mechanism. And it, I use this one for stone setting. This is sweet. I haven't seen them for sale anymore, but look at that. It's literally like a pencil. I love this one. There's, I, God knows what I, I probably paid a lot of money for this. But uh, this is really awesome. So if you ever find these, if you want some, because everything else kind of looks like, you know, this. Look at that. This is great for stone setting. That's all I use it for is stone setting. <laughs> What's this? Uh, that's a hammer hand piece. These are actually pretty good, these hammer hand pieces. But the one that comes with the, um, the Fordham Power Graver, I don't know if they still make this thing. It wasn't very popular, but I, I really like it. I mean, it's not as good as a Graver Max or a Lindsay, but then I'm not that good of a hand engraver, so <laughs> spending all that money ain't going to help me. I'm more just a, a chiseler. So, uh, yeah, this works pretty good. And you can control the speed right here. And this is, I use this for carving. I do a lot of carving with this on our dies. It's, it's pretty sweet. And I just use, um, I use old burrs for my, uh, gravers and i just grind them on here because oh. you know everyone's like what angles do i grind what do i need the special sharpener well I, I literally use busted off burrs i'll take the head of this break it off and then i use my sanding disc to shape my cutter for whatever task i have at that moment and then just go in and do it oh wow and cut it it's really fast and it's well it's just it's free and um but you can spend a whole bunch of money on fancy equipment. Heck, I got one. I haven't even used it. <laughs> I've had that thing, we've had that thing 10 years, and I've never even plugged it in. Because i kind of just been doing it by hand. And then I started loving that Graver Max thing. All right. So now they're roughed out. Let's take a measurement with your calipers and we'll see how much they compress when we put them in the hammer. I can't see nothing. <laughs> so let me do this in millimeters. 2.30 millimeters. Let's see if they're similar. 2.03 millimeters. So the one, it's interesting. Let's see. They're both missing that same corner, so I'm going to strike them both, and let's see if we can get them to even out. I'm not even going to anneal them, 
mostly because I'm just lazy. <laughs> but now that they're smaller, they should flow into that, into there pretty easily. Let's trade out our chai. I must say I'm impressed by how many people are very interested. With nothing else to do on Sunday? <laughs> Hi, bird. Watching us. There, there's die strikers out there, people in the die industry that might see this and they'd be horrified. <laughs> but we're kind of doing it how it would have been done in the mid 1800s because I have no interest in setting up the trimming tools. It just takes forever. So we're lined up again. It is funny because I get messages from people, you didn't use the proper force. And I'm like, eh. <laughs> if I start going to all that trouble to make one ring, it suddenly makes this whole process not fun anymore. All right, here we go. Nicely done. Mm -hmm. That definitely made it thinner. You can oh, see yeah. all the flashing around the edges yep. after the... Take a look. The next strike. That's there, it. you got that corner. Yep, got the corner. And we're now down to a reasonable thickness for our ring shank. Judy says you're her hero. <laughs> I am the master of half-ass. <laughs> All right, here we go. So I'm not lifting it very high this time. We're just kind of giving it a little bit. Eh, still didn't. I gotta go a little more. I'll get it again. If it doesn't work the first time, you just hit it harder. That time it did it. It's like fixing an old TV. Yeah, just hit it. <laughs> All right. So, there are our two stampings. One is definitely thicker than the other, but not by much. So, we'll just go with it. Yep. Have you ever lost a piece after you struck it? Yep. So has everybody else. You should tell them about all the pieces we dig out of the motors. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> so you can see here with a drop hammer. Uh, Jeremiah is restoring one of the drop hammers. But what would happen is where this anvil is, there would be a chair. And you would make stamping after stamping after stamping. And there would be a bucket behind the drop hammer. And each person would sit here. And after the hammer goes down, they'd have a little bamboo stick yeah a little stick and they'd flick it out and it would go into the bucket but the motor is also behind there and jeremiah right now is rebuilding one of the motors for the drop hammers and he's finding stampings that are all wedged up inside of the motor and they're just like you know they were struck 40 years ago and then just like nobody ever did any cleaning on it and so the motors are full of stampings <laughs> I find that pretty incredible. Kevin I'm... needs to have weekly camps once the pandemic ends. Yeah, that'd be fun. It's <laughs> not much fun just hanging. It's fun hanging out here with Vincent, but... <laughs> yeah, it'd be more fun having other people to hang out with and we, we just got appointments for our vaccines so yeah we're get we're getting the first shot on wednesday if nothing falls apart for some reason pima county has determined that um manufacturers and machinists are uh essential workers right? i guess we'll just go with it because they approved us <laughs> Look at these nifty pliers. I was hoping, I always wanted a pair of these, and they're made by Berjan in, in uh, the originals were made by Berjan in Switzerland. And then, supposedly, these were German. I do not believe it. Um, they are not made very well. And they were really expensive. But I'm still trying to find an original pair of Swiss ones. But they're sort of like vice grips for jewelers. And, uh, we're good.
I might actually, I've been so, I was so annoyed when I got these because I was, I'd seen the, you know, a bench jeweler that I used to work with. He had a pair and he, you know, if you touched them, he'd kill you. But, uh, he had a pair of the original Bergeons and I was like, oh, and so I've been looking for years and then I finally found these out of Chicago and I get them and they're like, I swear these are made in Pakistan. I mean, you can see where they use a torch to cut these things out. And I'm thinking, eh, the Germans didn't do that. <laughs> But I'm, they do work. I'm happy to have a pair. No, I am going to saw because I don't want to grind my fingers off. We'll have these saws done soon. I took all the handles over to the anodizer. And um, assuming nothing horrible happens at the anodizer, we'll have them back this week. And then we can actually start putting in all the rivets and assembling them. And I actually got, see these cool wing nuts? These are the last, you know, it's kind of silly that I even try to find this crap. But this is the last, these are made by Peerless Hardware. And they are the last U.S. manufacturer of wing nuts. And um, I can tell I can tell you why because they want four dollars a wing nut, but yeah, I, I bought them. So a bulk of the cost of your saw, if you bought one of these saws, it's in the wing nuts. And our and our goal to support uh, the manufacture of wing nuts in America. I gotta go to the bathroom real quick. I'll uh. Flip the camera around. Hang on, okay. I'm gonna try and clean the camera first. Right. I'll be right back. Uh, sure. Set it up. Try going. Right there. Let's get How about I just? I'll just entertain people for a minute <laughs> while, okay, you, I'll while be you go back. to the bathroom. So, wow, oh, gotta hold it pretty far away. Yeah, I'll show you the saw. So we started making these a long time ago. I mostly made them because I wanted a saw. And uh, I figured I'd solve the problems that the saws had, which was, one, the handle falls off, and two, the blade doesn't stay in. So we solved all those problems. And then you, you'll see that when I'm on my, the re, like on a, most saws, they use like a wing nut, but it screws into the frame. I put a stud. And the reason I did that is because if you sat at a bench for 20 years using the exact same saw, you wear the threads out and then your saw is junk. But if you put a stud in there, I use hardened steel studs and you put a wing nut, then when the threads wear out, you can actually take the, the stud out and the wing nut and put new ones on. So that this saw will last forever. Not to mention you can crank them tighter too without worrying about stripping out your saw. So that's why I did it. But it definitely it definitely makes things harder to manufacture. That's for sure. It adds a lot of extra steps. But uh, yeah, it's pretty cool. And uh, this one's real pretty. This one was engraved by a really famous hand engraver who we will not mention because he pro he made me promise that I would never tell anybody that he just did something for free at a show. I was actually in a in a booth um, selling my presses, and I showed him my saw. This was like 2007, and there was nobody there. We were all standing around doing nothing for like two weeks. And uh, just for fun, he engraved my saw for me. And uh, he's really good. And, uh, yeah... I think he said he'd charge like a thousand dollars to do that, but I I, I bought him um, a hot dog and a uh, and a bag of chips in, in exchange for this. So it's pretty sweet, and uh, so I got this really awesome saw, or at least you know the engraving on it. Anyway, hopefully my kid gets back here soon, and uh, yeah, yeah we're gonna. Um, I think Sandy wants to engrave a couple saws for us. So when we get the saws done, maybe you guys can talk him into uh, engraving one of your saws. It'd be pretty cool. 
that would be neat. And uh, I know Bill Rice engraved some too. So yeah, that'd be neat if you guys, or heck, engrave your own saw. Just kind of mess with it. Hurry up, Vincent, I'm running out of things to say. Anyway, we'll go for a little shop tour here. I'll show you what we're doing. So, uh, I'm gonna, oh, here's, here's my kid, so we're done. I'm gonna show you the, uh, the Christmas ornaments. All right, going back. All right, so we're back to sawing. So it's best to make sure your piece is fully supported. You know, I hardly ever put lube on my blade, but this time it seems really sticky. So we're going to use a little bit. Well, I remember the days when I could see what I was doing. <laughs> God, I can't see anything. It seems like I turned 50 and I just couldn't see anything anymore. So if I accidentally saw through my finger, which I'm sure is in front of the blade at this point, you know, there we go. I like to use two aught blades. I don't think I've ever bought any other size in my life. And if you're wondering about the brand, it's usually, I've just been buying Hercules, and uh, they seem to work good. Seems to be the, they've been around forever. A lot of times people complain about their saw cutting crooked, and, and it honestly is your saw. Because when you go to tension the blade, to put the blade under tension if your frame is really wimpy it'll twist and, and it'll get out of alignment and then you're you're it'll cut crooked because i see people all the time going something's wrong with my saw blades i'm like nah it's not your saw blades it's your <laughs> saw people are saying they're blind too yeah yeah i think that's what's happening to all of us they, they really like the saw though oh cool yeah I never intended to make them for honest production. <laughs> I just made it. We've only made, I don't know, I made a hundred and I thought, well, that ought to, that's more than anybody in the world would ever want. But um, <laughs> yeah, they sold pretty good. If you want to hear a funny story, the first time I made them, I made 10. And I, um, they, they cost me well, at that time, it was like 10 years ago, they cost me about 60 bucks a piece to make. And I thought, oh my God. Well, I'm only, I couldn't sell them for that. At least I didn't think I could. So I priced them at $58. So I'd only lose $2 per saw. Mm -hmm. and, and they didn't sell at all. Like they didn't sell. And I was like, well, screw it. I'm just not going to sell them. And I decided to put them on my website at what I would need to sell them for to actually reasonably make a profit so that we can afford to make them. So I priced them at $110. And uh, yeah, they started selling at $110. And uh, I was pretty shocked. Because they didn't sell at 58. And I actually sold a couple at $30 just to try to get some money back. But, um, but now with the price of metal going up and everything, we've... <laughs> They're, they're expensive to make. But now you know the story of the saw. What did I drop? Just the copper stamping. Oh, okay. Nothing like... Nothing valuable. Nothing valuable. I'm going to jinx myself and say, Boy, you think I can do this without replacing a blade? <laughs> all about perceived value. This is why jewelry pricing formulas are bunk. 
Yeah. Um, now it's all about the, uh, the, and you know what's really bad? The company that produces these wing nuts, I bought the last ones. I have enough to do 200 saws, so I bought all 400 of the wing nuts, and they, they told me they've stopped production of these because, well, you know, who, who buys $4 wing nuts? Like, nobody. So I got the last one. So we might actually be in the wing nut making business here soon. Custom Potter USA wing nuts? Yeah. I got an idea. I was thinking I'd make them in bronze and make them really pretty. And we'd die strike them in the drop hammer. Mm. Let me put some more little wax on this thing. Terrified of breaking the blade, always. Yeah, I'm more terrified of just running it through my finger, yeah, like that, the that's broken the, blade. Driving it right through the top of my fingernail. Exactly. Yeah, I've had that happen. Yeah. As I'm breaking the blade, you just like. Wouldn't it be awesome if you guys could? What we could like if I did that and we could watch it. Oh we God. Could Slow it down in slow mo and watch the thing <laughs> plunge through my fingernail. Oh man. And then the the tirade of cursing and swearing that would ensue. <laughs> All right, I'm just going to stop the tedium right now. We're just going to blast this off with the grinder. <laughs> Sorry, guys. There we go. Did I lose my other one? I did. It fell into the bench. I think. Did it? Oh, there it is. <laughs> I was like, gonna turn the camera onto the bench. Everyone start looking. <laughs> All right. You could totally just. <laughs> yeah, a full live of Where's Waldo. <laughs> And this is why jewelry costs a lot of money. Because you're literally paying for somebody to sit here and grind things. So we'll get one completely finished here. You know, I used to have like all these really nice sharp files until I had employees. Then they, they would use my nice files for horrible tasks. And I, I used to just blame Vincent, but now I just blame everybody on the whole for the destruction of my files. Let's see if this one's any good. You know it's bad when your file won't even cut silver. This one's not terrible. So, some people don't do that. File deliberately and purposefully pushing forward. And don't try to file a corner with, uh, you know, don't try to use a, I'll show you, you got to use different files for different surfaces. And always support your metal against your bench pin. I see people doing this, like, you're doing nothing. <laughs> All right, so it's looking really good. Next, let's find a, check this out, let's see. Oh, here's a cool file. Someone broke it, but it's going to work going to get this top piece. Mm -hmm. 
Man, I'm getting like crazy close-ups. Your camera is insane. Let's see how close we can get. Oh my god. Yeah? Oh yeah. It looks like security cam fo footage because it's so grainy because it's so close up, but you can really... You can really, see my lack of precision. You can really see what's going on. Okay, I'm going to zoom out. That's intense. I've been told filing only works in the upward stroke, but I have observed it work in both directions. Yep. Do as I say, not as I do. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So that looks pretty good. Now we do our second one. The next step after this is going to, we're going to actually anneal these because we're going to bend them. Actually, what I think I'll do, what I'm going to do, I'm going to figure out my a ring size and then I'm going to solder them together like that. <laughs> then I'm going to bend it into a shape. Then we will solder this in and then everything will become crystal clear. We'll show you all the little bezel dies and everything and everything is going to be like, oh. You guys will understand everything about how this is supposed to work. I suddenly feel better about all the shortcuts I take as a newbie. There's, there's Making jewelry is not a contest. It is not a competition. Whatever you can figure out, the, the goal is to make your customer happy. That's it. It's not to impress your friends. Well, you can if you want to, but it's to make sure your customer is happy. If, and, and your customer is not paying for your blood, sweat, and tears. What they're paying for is a finished piece of jewelry. So if you can figure out a way to create that piece of jewelry with less blood, sweat, and tears, then that's a, dude, that's a benefit because your hands only have so many hours in them of pushing a file. I know, because I actually, the only thing that saved me w was the big recession in 2008. My hands at that point were completely trashed. I couldn't open and close them anymore because I'd spent so many years working at the bench hunched over like this. I got these cool little bumps on my neck from being hunched over for years. <laughs> and I got my hands, I literally have to pry them open every morning and take tons of, you know, aspirin and ibuprofen just to get them open by nine o'clock in the morning when the store opened so I could actually work. And then it all went away. <laughs> I didn't get to work for a, a while because they were talking about surgery and everything, but then I, I would have to be out for like months and I couldn't not work for months. But time heals all wounds. Big recession pretty much cured my carpal tunnel. As long as I don't try to make 10 rings a day. <laughs> Once a week. Make something for fun. And it's worth it. All right. Nothing about metalwork is good for you. <laughs> no, no, it's not. So, that's a little bit long. So let's... I don't know if any of these rings... Oh, look at this. Check this out. So this is your little ring gauge on how far, you know, you can measure out your sizes and stuff. But um, let's see what we want to do. Let's make this like a... Uh, here's a rule that you guys may not know. Every woman is a size six and a half and under. Even if her finger is an 11... It's a six and a half. <laughs> Don't you dare say in a store, you're an 11. You get this, someone will put a ring mandrel through your skull. <laughs> so what you tell them is you go, oh, you're a six and a half, ma'am. That's what you say. It's never a size 11. I learned that. That's what I was informed when I worked at a store doing custom work because I have to size people's fingers. And uh, the owner of the store explained it to me like that. He said, if you tell someone that they're a size 11 or a 13, I'm going to hit you with this. 
They're always a size six and a half, even if they're not. Because you mark it down on the envelope and you tell them one thing and you write down another. Nobody wants the truth. <laughs> so, let's see. I'm debating how big this is going to be. It's going to be a six and a half is what it's going to be. I'm thinking if I solder it together. Why is the bezel in a concave shape? We're going to get to that. You are going to be, your mind is going to be blown when you see this. This is very important. And I tried to explain it, but I figured today was the only way I was going to ever explain this to everybody. Because people see it and they think, eh, it's not going to work. No, it's going to work. And it's you're going to go, oh my gosh. <laughs> it's so simple. So I'm going to take a little bit off of these. solder these together. So I'm going to put them like that. Now we could fuse them. I wonder if that's worth demonstrating or we just solder. You know what? I'm going to fuse it. So to fuse, we'll see if this works. Could make a big mess. Do you want me to fill that with water? Yeah, I go fill that with water. You guys get to show them our me. sink. <laughs> you get to go see our fancy sink, and all the lights are off. I'll turn on the lights before I use the sink. fusing material <laughs> you roll out your metal super thin and uh, what you do see there's people in the world there's jewelers who cut solder and there's jewelers who rip solder if they work in the same shop they're bound to kill one another because <laughs> everyone shares solder I, I'm a terror I tear my solder but uh, so I used to work with people who were cutters Annoyed me. <laughs> <laughs> and this white paste flux works really good for silver. Um, there's the green batterns flux. That really works for gold. It doesn't do well on silver. So we'll put a little drop of flux. And here we go. Make sure that these are touching. Let me go over here. So I'm using a Smith Little Torch because my favorite torch is actually sitting over there because someone hooked it up over there. I like a Mecco Midget. That's what I've always used. But these work good. They're pretty cool. Alright. Give us some firepower here. If you're going to fuse, it's really important that you use flux, unless you're doing platinum. Why do Keep you your... flux with platinum? It'll contaminate it. Mm. There it goes. Yeah, it'll get contaminated. I was thinking of doing a platinum ring today. Well, I was 60 people are watching. Oh, brother. Yeah, my, my goal today was to actually make a little platinum ring. I even pulled out all the parts. So we're going to do this little ring here. 
and I, I have a uh, um, I have an old little quarter carat diamond that would fit right in there. Really cool, an old mine cut. <laughs> we'll do that next week. Be sure and dry off your nice pliers. Don't let them rust. Alrighty. Sit that up there. I'm not going to do any uh, major grinding or nothing until I get it bent. So we're making a size six and a half. We'll do. Bring this up. This is great looking. I really like this. Good thing I cut a big hunk off of this thing. Otherwise, it wouldn't have been a six and a half. <laughs> it's like a size 10. But everybody's a six and a half these days. So now here, here's this is where you'll be really excited. See this little shape here, that concave shape? Notice how it fits on said ring mandrel. We're going to bring this thing up to size. Take it up to about an 11. And I'm going to trim this thing up and fit that in there. And it will fit. It'll follow the contour of the finger. And then your bezel goes on top of it. Oh, yes. That way you don't look like some barbarian who just makes a ring. And then, I mean, I see that stuff all the time. It's just barbaric. They Some maniac just... We're just going to stick a stone right on top. And, 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 you, <laughs> and you look down the side of the ring and it looks like that. And you're just like, huh. I'm confused about how the stone sits correctly without a flat back. It is a flat back. You'll see in a second. You see, wait, to, let me finish this piece. I'm going to start cleaning up this thing. And then you are going to see what this becomes. You know what? I'm going to show you another really exciting way to trim metal. Let's do it. We're going to go use a belt sander. <laughs> filing is not my favorite. I don't want to file. I'm, I'm seeing a couple of comments of people saying they get it. Cool. We see the light. Let me get some, okay, I got my water there. Now, if you're gonna belt sand silver, this stuff is gonna go on fire fast. And even the toughest fingers. Do you want a pair of pliers? No, let's see, let's see if I can make my fingers smoke. <laughs> So, 
check this one out. I got I caught myself on the belt sander the other day. <laughs> yeah. Everyone in the shop calls it the meat rake. Because <laughs> belt sander cuts are really bad. Yeah, I, I've had a couple. There's nothing to heal. You have to grow new, <laughs> new, new meat. They're asking what grit that belt was. Um, like 36? <laughs> <laughs> it was like a 36. What you want, they actually had seen them on Amazon. These little, I've been wanting to buy one. They're these little tiny belt sanders. They're made of a, they're really cool looking. And they're like this big. I want to get one. I don't know if they're any good or not, but they look really cool. So we're just going to get it nice and round again. The nice thing about using die struck metal is instead of cast metal it's you don't ever have to worry about all the porosity you end up with these really your, your rings can get super shiny let me uh reach over here we'll just finish it out If you guys don't have these things, these little sanding discs, these are awesome. It's like my favorite thing ever, these little sanding discs. The worst part is that I keep losing the little mandrels. I buy like packs of them and I leave them all over the shop so that I'm always <laughs> within reach of one. These make really quick work of stuff. They have all different grits too. And see, do a close up. See all this funky texture. Oh yeah, in here? We're, we're already really close. So what that is, that is the that's the rust pitting from the dye. So we used evapo rust to clean all the rust out of the dye, but it eats into the steel. So a rusty dye isn't that big a deal. A rusty hub, that's a big problem. But a rusty die, you can clean it out. So here we go. Where do you buy the sand in this? Oh, Rio sells them. Auto Fry, Stuller. Everybody has them. Shout out to Star Gems, Tucson, yep. Arizona. Yep, that's where I buy them. I'll go down to my local most of you guys probably don't have a local jewelry tools shop but we still have one amazingly <laughs> really super nice people too when are the curved back bezel parts going to be available uh well i was thinking about tomorrow but i didn't want to put them out until i actually made a video showing how they worked because um i don't want to sell you guys something that you don't know how to use well we sell a lot of stuff that people don't know how to use but I try to make videos and explain everything. But um, having a good description of how it works will it'll it'll show you you'll see that it's worth it. It'll make your rings look so much better. Sorry, if I'm in your way. Oh no, it's okay. You won't be a barbarian like just sticking stones on top of silver bands. You can build an integrated ring. People will think. Holy smokes, look at that. <laughs> okay. I really like these white pumice kind of wheels or something. I don't know. I, I think it's because I have like a zillion of them. <laughs> Somehow I ended up with like, I mean a truckload of these things. And I've just used them forever. Let's see. Looks pretty good. I want to get it cleaned up so that when I put my ring shank on it, did I lose my ring shank, Vincent? Um, oh, it's right here. Okay. So, check this out. This. Look at that. See how it forms the complete circle? Can you guys see that? Oh, yeah. They... And then at the top. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to do a little filing and grinding and fitting 
so that this looks like a really nice completed ring instead of just like some sort of barbarian glued a stone on top of a, a silver band. We're going to look like we know what we're doing. So I'm going to look at this shape here and I'm going to think how do I mimic, I, need, I want it to slide into it because I don't want to have a big gap between there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a ball burr. A little ball burr that's about the size of the little hump right here. What do I got? Uh, you know, it might not be a ball burr. It might be. I wonder if that's sharp. I use these things on tool steel. So, if you, I mean, we destroy burrs around here. And I buy them by the bundle. Because <laughs> we, we just wreck them. Tool steel is really hard. And we carve our, I carve tool steel with these burrs. So we're gonna, oh, you shot your bezel. Yes, so I gotta hold on to it a little better. It's harder than I thought. <laughs> so if you, you see what I just totally mangled my bezel. You know what? We're gonna have to use a file because I'm just setting showing bad technique there. <laughs> so, nice round file. And away we go. Yeah, that's better. This is a chainsaw sharpening file. Really? Yep. Wow. I like them because they're cheap. Because we do terrible things to files around here. <laughs> it's funny, a friend of mine, he uh, he was a snap-on tool salesman. And you'll see where the point of this story goes soon. And I was saying, who were your best customers? And, and, and I said to him, I said, do you ever try to sell to boat repairmen? And he goes, no, because snap-on tools don't float. He goes, they buy the cheapest, junkiest tools known to man. Because they sink just as well as the the snap-ons <laughs> and um, I see people spending a fortune on you know grow bay files and valor bees eh, I mean around here if you, I, I, I do like them but around here when I have some maniac grab my file and take it to the lathe <laughs> um, yeah no I'm not I'm not gonna buy a $70 file and have it torn to pieces on a lathe so that looks pretty nice. So we will we'll do some soldering. I'm going to do the other side and then we'll fit them together and hopefully it looks good. Not too off. We eyeball things around here. <laughs> All right. So that's gonna fit down in there like that. Let me open that one up a little bit more. There's a couple ways of doing this too. You can actually file the bottoms flat, but I thought this would be more fun to do it this way. So I'm going to open this up a little bit. There we go. And when you solder this, see, I see people trying all sorts of shenanigans. Like they'll have five third hands trying to create this little puzzle to hold all their pieces and balance everything. And really, if you just think for a second about how to assemble something, you, you can actually save a lot of trouble. And you don't need all those thingies. 
So we're going to build it like this, upside down. I'm going to put it on like that. Like if I wanted to, we could probably get away with that. But I think I will, I'll use one third hand if I can find one. Where'd it go? Oh, there it is. Very close. So we will flip that like that, hold that there, and we will bring this down. But yeah, I, I see it all the time, like people showing, how do I solder this to this? Or that to that? Well, I really, did I really go that far off? I really did. I'm going to have to fix this. Yeah, I'm going to restrike it. So watch this. Even though we've kind of buggered it up a little bit, I'm going to hit it again. Since it's still, I will put it in the hammer. Ugh. I appreciate your patience, Vincent. <laughs> no worries. What do we got, an hour in this? Uh, something like that, yeah. Wow. I know everyone's riveted with anticipation. I mean, viewership hasn't gone down at all, so. All right, here we go. So we're just gonna bump it again. That's one cool thing about making things heavy. You can strike them again. gotta smack something with it yeah we'll call it dunion rings anybody know where that saying came from dunion rings <laughs> oh i really stuck it let me crank that down wow oh there you go what's it look like it looks good again <laughs> like I didn't mess up. <laughs> See, if we were doing a, a video, I could have edited that out. And you guys would have been like, whoa. <laughs> he totally gets I like watching those guys. If you ever watch like Pablo Simadavila or Bobby White, they're really good jewelers. But I, I know that they're editing things out. Because I was watching one of them. You know, they're working with no magnification. And I'm like, oh, please. I was doing that in one of my videos going, yeah, they're going to think I can actually see. <laughs> so here we go again. I'm going to actually leave that top edge. That'll be cool. Yeah, because we have this nice little lip. I'm going to kind of use that as part of the design, I think. We'll see how it goes. So we're going to set it up. I'm so glad you're doing this. The rings with the setting and cab just plopped on top of the shank ends has always bothered me. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. I just, unless I, you know, don't you hate it when people criticize something, but they don't actually have a solution? So I try not to actually offer any advice unless I have a viable solution. And I, I've had this viable, I've known about this solution for a very long time. The only problem was I wasn't sure how to convey it to everybody that, you know, so if you look in there, give a nice close up and show them. So now you have this really nice base for your bezel and your ring doesn't look like a barbarian made it. So this is pretty cool, but you know, it's, I think it's a great idea. So I'm going to get in there and I'm going to solder this. Let me clean my metal here because this is a little dirty. So let me get my Flick shaft. We'll, uh, we're going to solder this. We will not attempt any sort of fusing. Whenever you're going to solder silver, do yourself a favor and get it, run it over with a wheel. And you really shouldn't breathe the dust off of these wheels. <clears throat> Bad for you. Now take a deep breath. Yeah, I basically spent my whole life taking deep breaths of this stuff. Hence. <laughs> Hence why you're eligible for a vaccine. <laughs> vaccine. Yes. Nothing like having lung disease. 
All right. Here we go. Let me get this one too. I know I see people going, I need, you're not going to get heavy metals poisoning just doing this for fun every now and then. Like even if you did it for like an hour a day or something, you get it when you do this um, 12 hours a day in a room with a bunch of other knuckleheads doing it 12 hours a day <laughs> and basically soldering with cadmium solders because boy, nothing makes things flow like cadmium, but that's how you end up with all sorts of issues. So you don't really need, I mean, not that I don't want you to be safe, but you don't need to be overly paranoid. You'll know it when you get sick too. Believe me, you will know it. So we're going to get some solder from our sheet and we're going to pick it. Think, is that paste solder? No, this is sheet. I never use anything but sheet. I know there's people who use wire solder, but that just seems like a way to flow a lot of solder all over your part. These are probably a little bit large, but you know, there we go. Let's, let's see, let me mix up my flux really good here. Uh, I always leave the lid off of it and it hardens up. All right, now it's stirred. Oh, here, watch this. We're just going to dunk. <laughs> and I'm going to use my tweezers. We're not going to even pretend that we could actually... Sorry if my head is blocking. No, it's mostly your hands that block it. Yeah, I can't see. <laughs> Let me take these off. Because it's just that good? Just that good. All right. See, when your bench, basically all jewelers end up with, the only space on their bench is this little, the bench pane. It's the only thing that's clear. Everything else fills with junk. Unless you're one of the people who trim solder. If you're a ripper like me, <laughs> you, your bench will look like this. <laughs> the trimmer people, they keep those, they keep tidy benches. I found those people to be total turtles. Like, just slow as ever. Like, they'd make pieces and it would take them forever. All right, I think we're... I think it looks pretty good. Yep, let me grab my torch. Yeah, I thought it was funny when you work next to people for years and you, you watch all their little habits. I, I'm, I, it's sort of like Oscar and Felix, if you ever remember that show. I, I'm a total slob, but I, I, was, I was really fast. I could crank out pieces like crazy. <laughs> There's like a rule, if you, for every... Like when you drop a diamond um, and you got to hunt for it, you look for w one minute per point. So the, the, uh, a one carat has a hundred points. Basically, if you drop a one carat, you, you're, you're going until you find it. But like the little tiny ones, two pointers, three pointers, you, you just don't stop working. So we use our solder pick and we flow solder in there and it for some reason the soldering god is with me and things actually flowed. I want to make sure I get it up on my, oh, that one didn't, so we'll hit it with some more solder. There we go. What do you use to rehydrate the flux? Water. And it's not even special water, it's just tap water. <laughs> All right, check it out. There's our ring. 
So what we're going to do next is we're going to actually use pickle. Let me uh, I get a good shot of it. Yeah, here. Actually, I'm going to go get some hot water and pour okay. it into my pickle. Turn on the light. I turn off the light. It is impossible to focus. There we are. Oh. Uh... So I turn my light off so that I can see how hot the ring got, so I don't melt it. So here we go into the pickle. Yay! And hopefully it goes nice and quick. I poured hot water in. Yeah, this will come off quick. I just use regular pickle. Um, you can use whatever you want, but I found that nothing seems to work as good as regular pickle. And as long as you don't drink it, I think you're probably okay. You know. <coughs> oh, caught a whiff of that. <laughs> Probably shouldn't smell it either. That yeah, looks pretty good. So let's uh, do some tidying up. Let me go rinse it off because my, you know, it's probably pickles hard on your skin too. While he's rinsing it off, I'll show you some of the stuff from France that came in all these nifty little containers. Check that out done by hand. <laughs> I just love the fonts on everything. Oh yeah, some people knew how to write. Alright. Those beautiful. The, the these, are, these are monograms for people's, when you'd have custom clothes made, you'd have your own custom buttons. Um, yeah, that's a real European thing. That's like, when you can afford to have custom clothes and custom buttons made, <laughs> That takes you're you to a, a new level. <laughs> yeah, you're a baller. <laughs> we, oh yeah, so here's a, here's a hollow one that I made the other day. So if you didn't want to strike it solid, you could strike it out of sheet. And then you solder a top onto it, and then you mount your stone. You do your bezel work. And I actually, you know, this would be a good time to go show you all the different ring tops that can go on top of this. So you could make a whole variety of cool things. So let's do that. Take a look at this real quick. You can see my sloppy soldering job, but we'll clean it up. It'll look good. And um, let's go find a top, something to put on top of this ring so it looks really cool. People are asking what your pickle is. It's uh, Sparex. Just the stuff comes in a blue, blue and white bag um, that everybody uses. At least I used to think everybody used it. So let's find a, uh, a ring top that we can do. Ooh, check this out. That would be kind of cool on top, wouldn't it? Oh, nice. We could put her right on top. That would be neat. That would be very cool. Yeah. Or we could put a flower. But if you wanted to put a stone, let me show you. So here, here's a bezel. This is a bezel for the top of a ring. So you would strike, there's a corresponding base that looks, actually you probably got one, take about, I grabbed them all out. We got tons of these things. So you would probably combine maybe, might be these two go together. So the top, this is your top, that's your bottom. This sits upside down and they even put cool little decorative pieces on it. Then you'd solder this, on top of here, and then you would come in with your decorative bezel wire that Vincent could roll. Mm -hmm. Well, we won't even go down that road because it's really complicated. But then mm -hmm. you would make your bezel and set your stone. And then you, that's how they made these antique looking rings. It will, these were how they made them. These are the original dies. 
but they would make them that way and you'd see they'd die strike everything and you, it looked like they hand engraved a ring and then they'd have the really fancy bezel wire and they would just look great. Ooh, look at this. I wonder if that would fit. That might fit. Check this out. So this one here is really cool. See these little dots? That's where you would pave little diamonds. So it's already got the holes set. So you'd go in there with a graver, you'd you drill the hole, and then you put your little diamond. It looks like you could take like a two-pointer, maybe a one-and-a-half pointer, and then you'd use a graver, and you'd raise up beads, and then you'd have your bezel for the top, and you'd bezel set like a sapphire or another big diamond, and that would set on top. You guys kind of understanding how this works? So take a look at this. This is a, this is a head. It's upside down. So imagine it like this, but you strike it like this, and then here's your prongs. These are all your prongs. And there's another one. It's got a nice little border on it. And you can see how it's the bottom of the ring. Here's a ring top. So if we used the right shape for the base, we could bake, you can mix and match all these shanks together. So here's where you put your diamonds or whatever kind of stones you want. And you just pave them in. Looks really cool. Here's another one. This one is just a cool little octagonal bezel and you would raise beads off the corners and that's where you'd set your stone. Some people seem very excited about the pronged one. Yeah, the only problem with these type of things, you gotta find a stone that fits that. <laughs> <laughs> so you gotta remember these were manufacturers so they could have stones cut to whatever size they wanted. You and I, not so much. So let's take a look here. This is, As you can see, like when you guys ask, hey, do you have such and such? And I'm like, well, we probably do. But finding it, that's like the big trick, is finding it. That. So here's another one. Check this out. So this is for a three-stone ring. This is the part that goes like that. And then this forms all your prongs, all these ribs. And then you just do it all by hand. And then you could even put this on here with, you know, on this shank. It would solder right on, you'd strike it, and you can mix and match all these components, which is really cool. Here's a pretty shank, look at this one. That's really pretty. It's got a, it's cracked up here on the top. So like when you buy stuff, you know, you gotta, it's hard to tell if it's any good or not, but I, we can definitely use that, I can fix it. So let's, let's find something to put on top of it that would be really cool. This is Larder and Sons. Yeah, this is all Larder and Sons. See this stuff here? So what this is, again, so this is all the gallery work in a head. So you would strike this piece, then there's a trim tool that would punch out all the gallery. And notice how they only did it on one side. You flip it. It saves on tooling. So you'd turn it to the other side and punch it again. And then you would form it. And there's probably, well, knowing these guys, there was a die to form it and a die to bend it, and mm -hmm. you, they were crazy. But they were basically making zillions of rings. Will the bottom curve of the bezel die affect the sizing too much? Mm-mm. No, that it's to prevent, like, check it out, fits my pinky. No, you just make your ring to the right size. So you figure out your ring size. Let's see if we've got a, an actual piece that's already in a, let's see, do we have a, See, the, check this out. Let me show you. This is a really cool little piece, and I like it, but notice, this isn't a hub. This is a force. So, it, this isn't heat-treated, and this isn't hard. And if I was to press this, it would, it would crush. So, we're not going to do that. We're going to find something else. If we wanted to use that, we'd have to play with the drop hammer for I'd, a while. Yeah, I, have to <laughs> that, I don't want to do that. Check out this body of this dragon. Isn't that awesome? I have the head. I just don't know where. It's somewhere. <laughs> we will find it someday. It'll be really awesome. It's going to be a great day when I find the head of that dragon. <laughs> There's just drawers of these things. And it's funny because people are like, wouldn't it be easy to, can't you just find it, Kevin? And I'm like, no. I know, oh, this would be cool. What do you think, just a little flower on top? Oh, I could see that. Yeah, me too. That'd be pretty. Yeah, definitely. Check this one out. See, it's got a split down the side of it. Oh, shoot, yeah. Yeah, it's split all the way here. But 
I already made a copy of it. Oh, you did? Yeah. I already oh. got a copy. So we'll go to the other cabinet that's got it. That's bigger. That's kind of cool. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to do this one. And I'm going to I'm going to do this hub because I know this thing's probably good. Let's at least, eh, I don't know. Maybe it's not heat treated. This is the frustration. <laughs> you go through these things. Let's just go with stuff that we know that we've already used. So let's see, flowers. They're sort of, um, but they, see, I would call it flowers, but the knuckleheads in my shop, they call it nature. And that, <laughs> then now you have like, oh, but then, no, they didn't. They called it botanicals. So the flowers <laughs> are over here under botanical. So these, we know that everything in these drawers, if we put a number on it, it's usable. It's not, it hasn't been, uh, it's not made of cheese. So I'm, I'm thinking I want to do a flower. People are asking, can they come over, photograph, and catalog, and digitize it all? <laughs> That's what Chris did for about four years. Yes, we had people doing this for four years, all day. And it's pretty much, it's hopeless. Because if I was to say I wouldn't buy another hub... Or another collection of hubs then yeah that'd be great but the problem is we are adding to it daily unless of course um technology stops and they stop <laughs> they decide that die striking is really the future instead <laughs> of the past where are some of those good flowers like that see this is the problem when people are like, do you have this Kevin? i'm like i don't know i think art nouveau has some flowers does it I doubt it. Mm, got to stop some I'm looking stuff, for I like a, just, I think it would be really cool with just a flower on top. And I know I have them. Just what you are. That looks, that's it right there. That looks big enough. That's it. I'm going to do that. We're going with that. Because right. I can, it's right here. This is one. Oh no. No, mm. we're going to go with this. This is pretty. That's what we're going to do. So I'm going to sink this real quick and um, make, uh, then we'll make a die. Even in all of my grandmother's jewelry, I've never seen a bottom curved bezel. Oh, please. Your grandma must not have been, they, they did, they all had bottom curves. Let me pull it out. We gotta, this is why we have this monster vise here. Because if you actually just try to pry this thing sideways, you'll crack the, the flower off. You got to... Uh... You're going to need to. You can't just lift it with one. Don't watch, folks. I'm using a file. <laughs> there it goes. And there is our guy. So let's, let's put this back in the drawer. That's what we call skilled labor. Yeah. If I didn't put this back in the right drawer, oh, which it came one? came from this one. Okay, good. Yeah. It, when something gets lost like that, mostly because of me not putting things in the right drawer, <laughs> it's lost forever. That's how, when we give you a refund on something, like, yeah, it's freaking gone. Let's, let's go strike this up. Yeah, for those who haven't seen this room in a while, Every single one of these cabinets is full. Yeah. Let's uh, let's do this in the press. I'm gonna do this hot. Okay. In our press. Sounds exciting. Yep. So. Put the spacers down. <laughs> Somebody's asking if they can buy the die we're about to use. Um. I, I, it's still the original, so I'm going to need to make a hub of it because if we sold more than one or two of those, that hub would break. It really, we don't normally work off an original hub because as you saw, it's a little dinky thing and that was, that one's probably a hundred years old and it's made of the end of a jackhammer bit or something. Much, yeah. 
So what I'm gonna do... The Italian tools are very, uh, they're beautiful, but they're not, uh, I swear. up to par necessarily. Well, it's because the steel wasn't very good. People say, oh, the old steel was the best. No, it wasn't. I'm here to confirm it for you. Let me tell you. The old steel was not the best. This stuff is terrible. So I'm going to gather up a couple little pieces of uh, silver. And we're going to melt it into a blob. 70 people are watching. Wow. So what I have here, this is, man, it's, probably, it's like hard to tell. You look at it and you think, how much silver should I plow into there? If I put <laughs> too much, then it'll be a pain. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to show you a little trick. Whenever, when I see people trying to make shot dies, I should probably make some of these for everybody. What this is, this is just a, uh, it, it's, I use it as a mold to make shots. And what I do is I make it with a point because what I see is people melt it onto their soldering block and then they have, it's all nasty. It gets all gross because it, it fills up with slag. So what you do, you use a crucible like this. <clears throat> all right, I'm gonna set this right here. I'll lose it. <laughs> I'll, I'll, lose keep, it. So I'll keep track remember, of it. I, that's what I need to do is just continually do live streams <laughs> and people can tell me where I set things down and lost them. <laughs> so we're going to melt our metal. I'm going to blow up. There we go. Forgive my grimy fingers. I've been working as usual. You want to warm that up a little bit? This will make a really nice shot instead of like a nasty little blob that then you beat the snot out of with a hammer and get stuck in your mold. So here we go. There it is. There's our shot. From here, we grab it. Like that. Do not cool it off. You're going to set it like that. So it's still nice and hot. You're going to center your work. Okay. Thanks, Mario. Bye, Mario. All right. Notice we've got. Oh, sure. Please, you can lock it up. I want a dot maker. All right. I'll make some this week. <laughs> so let's, you'll be able to see this thing. It's perfect. And that didn't require very much force. I need to make more videos showing this kind of stuff. So take a look. <laughs> you saw me pour this, pour the metal and then press it into the die. And I didn't cave the die in. I didn't, the metal wasn't severely stuck. And we got a beautiful little sunflower or whatever the hell, that, whatever that is. <laughs> All right. So the next step we're going to trim this. And now if I was to trim this off and stick it back in there and strike it again, that's when you don't have enough of a lip. Because I see people who don't pour a big enough blob. You, you gotta have something to pry it out. Otherwise, that thing could be in there for life. Okay? So, here we go. Oh, stuff on the blade. Ah, he's going back to the saw. I probably should just go to the band. Let's just go to the band saw. I don't <laughs> want you guys to have to sit through this. Come on. Let's go cut this thing.
<laughs> you can you can literally use this like a file and just cut everything out. It's a little barbaric, but now I call this true craftsmanship. Look at how steady your hand is. Oh yeah, it's from the six pack of beer I drank this morning. It steadies <laughs> me. I'm ju I'm just kidding. I, <laughs> I'm just joking. Somebody said they they would sit and watch you do a live stream of you drinking beer and watching TV. <laughs> A lady said that she's been able to stop getting her stamping stuck in her body by using dropout bullet mold release. Oh, cool. Very cool. All right, so next we're going to just rough this thing in real quick. See, I think a lot of people should use more power tools. I mean, I enjoy sitting at the bench. When I'm not trying to make a video, I usually just sit here and do it by hand. But when I used to do this for money, I would I would use tools and machines to really because you know Vincent ate a lot as a child <laughs> and um, yeah so we're gonna go at this with a little burr try to hit it with a little lube. You can see I'm just kind of roughing it out, removing a bulk of it. All right, so there we go. Next thing I'm going to do, I'm going to use my sanding disc. Oh, I'm going. To, I've been trying. See, I got this really cool set of burrs from a friend of mine, and I've been trying to put them back so that I don't lose the burrs. <laughs> Usually what happens is they end up in my drawer. I just throw them in the drawer. Okay, pop that off. Pop our thing on. There we go. And don't worry about like on something like this. If you overcut, don't worry about it. You've got a graver. You got burrs. You can recarve. Oh, it's getting hot. Cleaning up pretty quick though. Sorry, my head's blocking it. Oh no, you're good. I got a good shot. Just working my way around it. Let's get some close-ups. So you can see it cleaned up pretty fast. So let's see if there's... Let me show you guys something. So notice, even when I hit this, take a look. I want to show you guys something about dyes. So there's detail in the ends here that I didn't get. But... I want it. So here's what I'm going to do. We're going to grab a little cutter. I'm going to actually... So rather than take this thing and start, you know, just driving it into the dye. Oh, that hurt. Oh, man. I oh, cut myself. no. I'm bleeding. We'll live. <laughs> it's the, uh, it's called a, uh, it's 
It's called a cut my finger burr is what it's called. <laughs> but, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go right in here and just carve the lines. Like oh, that. Wow. Oh, nice. Yeah. And... Rather than agonize and try to push the life out of this thing, we will just make a few cuts. All right. I'm not going to bleed to death. <laughs> We're going to live. So there we go. There's our piece. That looks kind of cool, doesn't it? It's, it's a little cool. thick, so I don't like how thick it is. Asking what kind of bit that is. <laughs> it's a cut your finger bit is what it is. It's a, a knife edge. Oh, wow. It's called a knife. And I accidentally stepped on my the gas pedal when I had it in my hand. That is so small. Yeah, but I love them. So here's, this is what it's going to look like on the ring. But I'm a little concerned with the thickness. So I'm toying with potentially, I don't know, do I hit it again? Do I strike it again? And lower the thickness. Or, and it up. or if I strike it again, it's liable to get stuck. What so, if you stick it in there and then and take that to the grinder? Well, we could take it, definitely take it to the grinder, but most people don't have a belt sander. So I'm going to show them, I'm going to put it in here like this. I've never considered that. That's... Well, that's why I get paid the big bucks, son. <laughs> the master of half. Do you get paid the big bucks? Unfortunately not. <laughs> that's why we're working on Sunday, son. <laughs> but no. So you can see how it'll hold it in the die. And, and don't be afraid to use a real file. I mean, this is just a hardware store file. Nothing special. This is a... Uh, it's a bastard file. But you can see how your die will hold it, which makes things a lot easier. You could, if you didn't have a die, you could put it into a uh, pitch if you wanted to, or you could put it into that plastic stuff that you boil. I love that stuff. The jet set, I think they call it. That's pretty cool. So this works pretty good. So we're just motoring this thing down pretty fast. I usually have holes in my pants from using my cleaning my files off on my sh on my pants. <laughs> Speaking of clothes, there's a, a a saying. Everybody wants to wear Carhartt until it's time to do Carhartt shit. <laughs> and uh, I was at Time Market the other day, and I saw this hipster wearing a Carhartt vest and, like, van checkered Vans shoes and skinny jeans. And I said, everyone wants to wear Carhartt until it's time to do Carhartt shit. And without skipping a beat, he says, you won't see me doing Carhartt shit. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. You've just been... Uh... Forced into it, into the I, child labor. I don't know, man. I almost got insulted when I saw him wearing that. I'm like, you don't work at manufacturing. Yeah. But I know that's like ridiculous gatekeeping. <laughs> gatekeeping. Gatekeeping. It's when oh. you're not allowed to like something unless it's authentic. Or you, oh. you know, the kind I'm of I'm learning like, so uh, much. <laughs> kind of like, um, okay. oh, you like this band? Name 10 of their songs. You know, that, that's gatekeeping. Oh. oh. Got it. Right. You guys have probably had enough of me filing a piece of silver. I really <laughs> overstruck. Put way too much silver on there. So I think I like I like things to have a little bit of heft to them. So now what I'm going to do is make sure that I'm flat. He was a poser. <laughs> yes, he was. <laughs> All right. Let me use a graver to pry it out. So we take our graver and lift it out. Lovely. That looks really nice. Now, that's actually looking decent. 
it is still a little thick, but I don't feel like so I don't feel like filing anymore, and I'm sure you guys don't want to watch me file more. So what I'm going to do, we're going to clean the back of this and take this finger cutting burr out. I'm going to disc sand this. There we go. And people are asking about me. I am 21. Uh, I've been working here since I was seven. Yeah. He was my child labor force. <laughs> I used to put him at a lathe when he was a little kid. And he'd run this. We had this little hardened lathe. And I had the belts extra loose so that it couldn't eat him. <laughs> so no matter how big a mess he made, he never could uh, hurt himself with it. The only problem was he, I'd come home. Like if I left him alone in the shop. Him and his friends, they would use, they'd be using the hydraulic press, basically extruding their G.I. Joe figures in any little toy they could find. They'd put it in the press and squeeze it. There's just <laughs> destroyed plastic toys all over the shop. Bunch of maniacs. <laughs> Alright, put a little bit of flux. Put the other one on there. Try not to get the flux in my cut. That burns. And you do that. So there it is. I'm going to take that little piece of solder there and I'm going to plop it on there and then I'm going to set this on top. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to solder to this first. Hopefully this works. Otherwise, you guys are going to go, what a half-asser. <laughs> so we're going to get our flame up pretty good because it's a pretty big chunk. We're going to pre-warm up our disc so that when we put the solder on it, it doesn't bubble off. Oh, there we go. Fix it. Next thing we're going to do... Some people are saying their children like to pump up the hydraulic presses. Oh yeah. I, I, I got to tell you about this one time. I had a lady call me and complaining that her that the paint the powder coat on her hydraulic press dissolved and i, I was, couldn't figure out what what had happened and so finally we got down to the issue we, we, i after a little bit of prodding i figured out what happened so what had happened was her son took a can of monster energy drink and he put it in the hydraulic press. And whoa. Oh, you're balancing out. Ooh. Talk about a balancing act. Sorry, keep going. So he, he took a can of monster energy drink and he put it in his in his mother's hydraulic press. And exploded it. And then it was all sticky with this with the soda. And then he took brake parts cleaner and sprayed it all over the press and all of the powder coat came off the press. It was a disaster. <laughs> and of course it was my fault, but we, we actually were able to help her out. We got it all fixed. But yeah, don't put brake parts cleaner, it'll dissolve the paint. <laughs> brake parts cleaner will pretty much dissolve anything. All right, I'm going to go over here, get our ring, and I'm going to not grab it with the finger that I have cuts on, <laughs> because that would really hurt. We're going to go rinse it off, because if you don't rinse it off, um, you'll rust your tool. And then, so now we're going to polish this baby up. It shifted a little bit, but it's not too bad. It's going to look good. <laughs> so let's clean it up. I can't believe you guys have watched this entire process. So, 71 people. Oh. Make sure we're...
I actually have these really cool sandpaper roll things. And um, I think my employees think they're cool too because I can't seem to find one. So we're just, I'm just going to go after it with a barrel burr just to get this interior cleaned up. They're, they're in for the long haul. <laughs> you guys are in for the long haul? <laughs> the lady says she's going to wash the whole thing again later. Well, hopefully I'm... Very informative. I hope. So, take a look at how nice the back of your ring looks when you have that little, that little platform. It looks really good. Very cool. All right. Next step. You can see where I really screwed up right here. See how it's, I shifted it? Now, if I was a crazy person, we would be trying to fiddle with it. But did you notice when I was soldering that my entire top was coming loose? So, we're, we're not going to be maniacs. And, you know, good enough is the enemy of perfection. And, you know what? We're just going to go in here and... Say hi, Craig. Craig watching us? Mm-hmm. Oh, brother. <laughs> Craig, Craig is a uh, solder clipper. <laughs> He's not a ripper. So Craig is like the best goldsmith I've ever met in my life. His work is spectacular. He is really good. I'm, I think the term is called good enough. So I'm just going around basically carving this out. We'll throw this on a scale too and I'll tell you exactly what it costs to make. And then you can figure out how much it would be you could sell it for. So we're not perfect. There's some problems here and there, but you know. The world is an imperfect place as uh yeah. What's his name? Um, from the Breakfast Club. <laughs> so what I'm going to do is I'm going to even out the bottom and kind of blend it together. John Bender. Oh. Yeah, we're going to even out the bottom of this thing a little bit and just kind of make it look okay. And it actually doesn't look bad. It's nothing horrible. Let me... Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know how much longer I feel like anybody wants to watch this kind of stuff. But. <laughs> and when you're stamping these rings, 
you can actually make them as thick as you want. <laughs> well, it's not quite perfect, but I'm enjoying myself. Yeah, I definitely should have uh, tried to straighten that a little bit. It got a little wonky, but it still looks pretty cool. I mean, as far as the ring goes, I kind of like it. The bottom's not as perfect as I would have wanted because it shifted. But, um, you know, if we were making 10 of these, we'd probably get good by our 10th one. Let me go after it with my disc sander. Yeah, it definitely would have been better to attempt to straighten things out. But it just basically, I see this a lot with beginners. They, there'll be a problem with a piece. And rather than work their way through it and just finish the piece, they will stop and they'll die on that hill. They will work until they completely mangle the piece. And that's just crazy. What you should do, you finish the piece. And even if it's a piece of crap, you just finish it and move on. Like, I'm not going to agonize about this little bottom piece of this ring because we'll just, if we were to make another one, I guarantee you we would do it in a fraction of the time and I would get it dead nuts. But, you know, we were pretty much just winging it today <laughs> and uh, it's not perfect. Looks pretty good though. And my wife, she doesn't complain about my jewelry too much, other than <laughs> being heavy. So I'm just kind of blending it all together. But that's the biggest thing. When you start a piece, just finish it, even if it's terrible. Just finish it. You don't have to sell it to anybody. Give it away. That's usually what I would do with stuff that didn't work out well. Unless it was valuable materials or something, just give it away. Yeah, this is actually looking okay. It's cleaning up pretty good. Finish the corners. And then we're going to go hit this with the polishing machine. We call it Dunion Rings. But that's one of the biggest things. Just, even if it's not great, just finish it. You'll learn a bunch. And uh, we'll hit this with a little patina and polishing. And, eh, don't like my little divot there in the back, but I'm not going to agonize over it. I'm just going to polish it down. There we go. When you're making jewelry for like a store or for customers, you gotta, you know, you're gonna do the best you can to make things perfect. I'm now making jewelry for pure enjoyment. No other reason. That's why you never see me sell anything. I always ask people who point out a flaw, where were you when I was doing it? <laughs> All right. Now the next step is I'm gonna hit this with a rubber wheel. And then we are going to the polishing machine, and then we're going to patina it. You know what I'm probably going to do is I'll patina it first, then go to the polishing machine. That'll save a step.
Now, if I a sanding stick is where the, probably the next step would have been using a sanding stick to keep everything nice and level and smooth. So you're probably learning a lot of bad habits from me on some of this stuff. But, you know, we've been at this for over an hour and my phone's going to die. <laughs> and um, so I just kind of want to get it done. Is that a pumice wheel? Yep, it's a pumice wheel. And we'll go in here and knock out these corners a little bit. Alright. Now, I'm going to break the edge so it doesn't cut someone's finger. Alrighty. Now, we'll go at it with this stuff. Let me go find my paintbrush. I put the paintbrush over here so that it doesn't rust all my tools. This stuff is, actually, let's just go do it over here. This stuff is toxic. If you don't patina your silver, I, don't know, I, I like it to have a big head. I like it dark. Lots of patina. I, I kind of think it looks cool. Black and everything. And even the inside, we'll just do the whole ring. Looks good. All right. Next step. You rinse it off in water to kind of stop the reaction. <laughs> Here's our ring. It's all jet black. Let's go over to the buffer. And then this video is going to be over with. <laughs> This is the coolest, coolest buffer. Alright, here we go. This is white diamond. I'm sure everybody's got their preference. I use it because I got a big stick of it. This funny. thing's pretty sweet. It's got all these cool gauges on it. The frame rate on the phone can't keep up, and so it looks like the wheel is spinning really slowly. Oh, really? Yeah. I'm going to let you guys in on an amazing place. It's called, this. I got this machine at HGR Surplus in Cleveland, Ohio. It's like the scrapyard to the universe, <laughs> and they sell, they don't test anything. So you don't know if anything works, but it's cheap. So like, I think I paid $500 for this machine. It's a, a Torrit Donaldson with a ball door motor. It was in a Tiffany factory and it was like 500 bucks. A machine like this would be like five or six, or probably like seven or $8,000. So I always look on there. Every night, I, I, I'm looking on HGR Surplus for junk. <laughs> and there's so much cool stuff. Alright, let's 
go wipe this thing off, then you can get a nice picture of it, and we're going to call it good. It's kind of cool. I like it. Hey Dan, it's called HGR Surplus. They don't warranty anything and they won't even tell you if it works. You just, basically you just buy it and hope for the best. That's pretty much how it works. But um, it's cheap enough that if it's something, you know, you know, you can literally buy your own paper mill there. They, they have every everything there's entire steel rolling mills have been sold through there it's a, it's in an old uh car assembly plant in ohio and it's like 12 square miles of junk it's truly spectacular oh that's mm. looking nice yeah let me use my shirt it's like the only clean thing i got <laughs> okay and i hold on to it more. you guys can see it on my hairy fingers <laughs> there we go it's so delicate and dainty <laughs> and you can see the bottom how it blends in but that's what those things are for and then from the side it's a little wonky but if I had to do it again I probably would have uh, I probably would have put a stone in the ring but when I saw this little flower I was like that's probably the right thing for today <laughs> and uh, yeah and it looks great on my finger. Yep. It's a little, probably could stand to use a different polish, but this is what we got. Anyway, thanks for watching guys. See you later. Have a good Sunday.